As a great nation, we become greater when we unite behind a common purpose. And for these reasons, I strongly support Senate Resolution 159. And may God continue to bless the United States of America. Mr. President, I note the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka. that the quorum call be dispensed with? Without objection. Mr. President, I think most Americans are no. proud that the man who orchestrated the 9-11 attacks and then reveled in the horror of that day is dead. Today we recognize the dedicated work of the many intelligence professionals, law enforcement officials, and the many men and women in our armed services who brought us to this day. The pursuit of Osama bin Laden spanned over a decade. Following the attacks of September the 11th, the Senate voted 98 to nothing to authorize the use of force against al-Qaeda, an authorization that is still in force today. At the time, President Bush enjoyed the support of a nation united behind his decision to pursue al-Qaeda and to drive the Taliban from power. We should be equally united here today in honoring those brave Americans who are committed to preventing further attacks upon our homeland. While bin Laden and his followers were building their terror networks, we were patiently and diligently building our intelligence capabilities. And following the successful raid on Sunday, those who remain committed to al-Qaeda and associated terrorist groups should know that one day they too will share bin Laden's fate. Some might think that the success of this raid means the end of the war on terror. But as the President has said, the death of Osama bin Laden does not mean the death of al-Qaeda. And our intelligence community and armed services must keep up the pressure on al-Qaeda and associated terror networks. Osama bin Laden launched this war on the false assumption that America didn't have the stomach for the fight. On Sunday night, he learned how wrong he was. And this week, America showed the world that we meant it when we said we would not rest, not rest, until justice was done to those who carried out the 9-11 attacks. A generation of patriots has pursued al-Qaeda for more than a decade, driven by the idea that every day is September the 12th, 2001. That spirit must persist. So once again, I want to commend the President on this decision to go through with this mission. Above all, I want to thank the remarkable group of men who carried it out. Not to be forgotten are the thousands of uniformed Americans in Afghanistan, Iraq, and across the globe defending America's interest as we consider this resolution 
today. The resolution reaffirms the Senate's commitment to eliminating safe havens for terrorists in Afghanistan and Pakistan, and we're reminded of the difficult work that remains. But today, those who remember the horror of 9-11 take a certain satisfaction, knowing that the last thing Osama bin Laden saw in this world was a small team of Americans who shot him dead. The brave team that killed bin Laden made their nation proud, and they deserve the Senate's recognition and its praise. Mr. President, I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Missouri. I thank the, thank the uh, presiding officer for recognizing me. I, I stand as uh, every member of this Senate does today in, uh, I am sure, in uh, support of not only this resolution, but everything this resolution stands for. Uh, the elimination of Osama bin Laden as a symbol uh, of uh, murder, of tyranny, of repression uh, is an important moment. It's a moment that, la that, that came 10 years after it should have. If we could have found Osama bin Laden 10 years ago when we were looking for him, 9-11 might not have occurred, uh, but it did occur, and the message to him uh, for and the message to others was that uh, you can you can't hide from the forces of freedom and democracy. This was a, a a moment when the forces of freedom and democracy triumphed over the forces of repression. This was a moment when the symbol of one view of the future uh, was eliminated with the violence that and the kind of violence that he himself uh, had, uh, had had perpetrated on so many others. Uh, I, I think the president made a, a great decision uh, to send this, this team of uh, the best of the best uh, in to uh, this uh, compound to find Osama bin Laden, to know for sure, face to face, that either he was going to be uh, captured by, by Americans uh, or, in this case, killed by Americans, uh, to be able to uh, take the uh, the hard drive, the documents, the information that he had surrounding him uh, tells us a lot. It will tell us a lot about uh, his contacts, and who knows what it might tell us about uh, the network of, of Al Qaeda. Uh, you know, the president could have made a decision to bomb the compound, and I guess we'd be shifting through the ashes today to see if Osama bin Laden was there or not. And we might have been able to confirm that, but we wouldn't have been able to confirm all the information. Uh, that the SEAL team was able to uh, take with them. I think these were two uh, important decisions made by the President. The, the decision to uh, bury Osama bin Laden in an unknown spot, uh, but with, uh, the, w with the kind of, uh, of uh, respect that his own religion required was also, I think, another good uh, decision. And uh, I want to be supportive of the President and, and the decisions made. Uh, there are times, I would think, when the Predator missile is the right things to use, and there are times when it's not. One of the other things that we see from uh, the uh, death of, uh, of bin Laden uh, is that uh, there is value to capturing our enemies and getting information from them. Uh, and that thread of information that began maybe as much as nine years ago finally was able to unravel in a way that made the connection that needed to be made so that Osama bin Laden could be found, uh, so that his, uh, his, the justice could be done, so that the price would be paid uh, by him as it's been paid for, by so many others uh, in defense of freedom. Uh, and certainly, uh, Mr. President, there are questions today about, uh, about Pakistan, uh, but there's no question that uh, Pakistanis have died fighting alongside Americans in the last decade. Uh, there's no question uh, that Pakistanis have been the victim of terrorism. Uh, hopefully, this will be a moment that brings uh, all of those who should want freedom uh, to the same side. I uh, just returned from a quick visit to, to Egypt, which could very well be on the right path for the Middle East, a path where without violence, people, uh, and, uh, people stand up and want more freedom, uh, they, want, they, want more, they want democracy, 
Uh, and that's not the goal of the extremist in, in Islam that Osama bin Laden uh, became the great symbol for. And we don't believe that Osama bin Laden's been in uh, control, in operational control of uh, al-Qaeda for some time. It would be wonderful if we find out in the next few days he was and that the, uh, the, the, the terror of al-Qaeda would uh, be eliminated. I don't think we'll find that out. Uh, but we do know that he is a symbol that was unique in the way he symbolizes this wrong view of the future, the way he symbolized this wrong view of, of uh, the requirement that everybody living together be exactly the same. Uh, and uh, we, unlike any other country in the world, defy that view of the future. You know, we have proven, like no other country's ever proven, that people can live together uh, in great uh, diversity, that people can live together with different points of view, uh, and you can live in a society that still flourishes. Uh, and so, of course, we're the enemy of a worldview that that's not possible. And it's not because of anything we've done to uh, the extremists uh, in the world community, but it's because who we are. Uh, and yesterday, the message of who we are was registered again uh, in a powerful way uh, as we all, all over this country and people all over the world talked about what had happened the evening before. Uh, and certainly not only the SEALs that went in uh, to the compound uh, to see that justice was done, uh, but also all of those who are willing to serve, those who could have been among the elite that went in or all those who have served the, four th the over 4,000 uh, Americans, including many Missourians whose lives have been lost in the last decade, in addition to the 3,000 lives that were brutally taken uh, by the, the, the uh, operatives of al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden on September the 11th, uh, 2001. Uh, and so this resolution that recognizes the courage to bring justice, uh, that recognizes the evil that was done by Osama bin Laden and his followers, uh, that recognizes the importance of freedom and democracy in a society, uh, is, a, is a resolution that I'm proud to support. I'm, uh, I'm uh, proud of what uh, the men and women did for us who executed uh, this well-planned um, mission, but also of everybody who serves every, every day, uh, for all the families who have a, a, a missing place in their family, for someone whose life was lost serving the country, for all the families who live with uh, someone with disability, because of the kind of war we're in now. And so, uh, Mr. President, I uh, am uh, pleased to stand here representing uh, my state, but hopefully representing, it all, as all of us do, uh, the forces of freedom and democracy uh, that will ultimately triumph over the forces of repression uh, and murder uh, and chaos that uh, one worldview would try to perpetuate. Uh, and uh, we recognize today another step against uh, that view of the world, and I yield back. I have a question at quorum. Uh, clerk will call the roll. Mr. Kaka.
I ask consent to call the quorum be terminated. Without objection. I would ask there be. Oh yes. Order, Senate. Uh, order, please. The leader. Mr. President, those watching around the world may not be able to see on their screens the scene here in the United States Senate today. We have all come to the floor in a way we rarely do. We've come here this afternoon to express with one voice our endless respect and admiration for the men and women of our military and our intelligence organizations. Resolution is an appropriate name for this, this legislation that's now before this body. It honors the resolution to a problem that has lingered for nearly a decade, one whose weight has grown heavier each day on the shoulders of the families Bin Laden traumatized and the many more he terrorized. It honors the resolve with which our bravest stared down danger. The world is still absorbing America's astounding accomplishment, a mission to bring Osama bin Laden to justice, one that began more than nine and a half years ago and was accomplished just a little more than a day and a half ago. Nine and a half years after the worst morning in our memory, we woke up yesterday morning to a world without Osama bin Laden and with a palpable sense of justice. Our military and intelligence operatives are the best in the world at what they do. As they set out to kill or capture our most valuable target, they captivated us with their skill and expertise, their patriotism, and their professionalism. A flood of thoughts and emotions and analysis has been shared over the past 36 hours by many. As I said from this desk yesterday, the end of his life is not the end of this fight. It is a victory, but it is not the victory. A lot has already been said about what bin Laden's death really means. <coughs> So before we vote on this resolution, I want to speak only briefly about the American men and women who carried out this critical, successful mission, a mission that was historically significant and tactically stunning. Osama bin Laden was the most wanted and most hunted man in the entire world. His was the face of our enemy and the face of evil. There were few faces more recognizable to the American people and to the citizens of the world. Those who carried out the Commander-in-Chief's orders this weekend could not be more different. The world doesn't know their names. We wouldn't recognize them if we passed them on the street today. And that's exactly how they would want it. This is the newest proud page and long story of the American hero. The unknown soldiers, the unsung saviors, the sacrifice for our country's flag and their countrymen's freedom. They don't ask for recognition. They don't ask questions. They just answer the nation when it calls. 
Today, the Senate stands in awe of the countless men and women who have toiled in obscurity in the field in every corner of the world. Professionals who gather one small shred of evidence here, unearth another clue there, pursue another lead somewhere else. The men and women who, over the course of 10 long years, pieced together the most meaningful pu puzzles so that a few dozen of their fellow heroes could execute an operation the world will never forget. These heroes confronted fear with brilliance and bravery. They met the worst of humanity with the best of America. The terrorists who carried out the 9-11 attacks did so with cowardice. The Americans who carried out this mission did so with unfailing courage. No one has asked how these men and women vote or what their politics are. And so we've come here to the floor today to vote together on this resolution, not as two parties, not even as 100 senators, but as one body representing one grateful country. On this resolution, Senator McConnell will ask for the yeas and nays. Is there a sufficient second? There is. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka. Mr. Alexander. Aye. Mr. Alexander. Aye. Ms. Ayotte. Aye. Ms. Ayotte. Aye. Mr. Barrasso. Aye. Mr. Barrasso. Aye. Mr. Baucus. Aye. Mr. Baucus. Aye. Mr. Begich. Mr. Begich, aye. Mr. Bennett, Mr. Bennett, aye. Mr. Bingaman, Mr. Bingaman, aye. Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Blunt, Mr. Blunt, aye. Mr. Bozeman, Mr. Bozeman, aye. Mrs. Boxer. Mrs. Boxer, aye. Mr. Brown of Massachusetts, aye. Mr. Brown of Massachusetts, aye. Mr. Brown of Ohio, aye. Mr. Brown of Ohio, aye. Mr. Burr, aye. Mr. Burr, aye. Ms. Cantwell, aye. Ms. Cantwell, aye. Mr. Cardin. Mr. Cardin, aye. Mr. Carper, Mr. Carper, aye. Mr. Casey, Mr. Casey, aye. Mr. Chambliss, Mr. Chambliss, aye. Mr. Coates, Mr. Coates, aye. Mr. Coburn, Mr. Coburn, aye. Mr. Cochran. Mr. Cochran, aye. Ms. Collins, Ms. Collins, aye. Mr. Conrad, Mr. Conrad, aye. Mr. Coons, Mr. Coons, aye. Mr. Corker, Mr. Corker, aye. Mr. Cornyn, Mr. Cornyn, aye. Mr. Crapo. Mr. Crapo, aye. Mr. Dement, Mr. Dement, aye. Mr. Durbin, Mr. Durbin, aye. Mr. Ensign, Mr. Enzi, Mr. Enzi, aye. Mrs. Feinstein, Mrs. Feinstein, aye. Mr. Franken. Mr. Franken, aye. Mrs. Gillibrand, Mrs. Gillibrand, aye. Mr. Graham, Mr. Graham, aye. Mr. Grassley, Mr. Grassley, aye. Mrs. Hagen, Mrs. Hagen, aye. Mr. Harkin, Mr. Hatch. Mr. Hatch, aye. Mr. Hoven, Mrs. Hutchison, Mrs. Hutchison, 
Aye. Mr. Inhofe. Mr. Inhofe. Aye. Mr. Inouye. Mr. Inouye. Aye. Mr. Isaacson. Mr. Isaacson. Aye. Mr. Johans. Mr. Johans. Aye. Mr. Johnson of Wisconsin. Mr. Johnson of Wisconsin. Aye. Mr. Johnson of South Dakota. Mr. Johnson of South Dakota. Aye. Mr. Carey. Mr. Carey. Aye. Mr. Kirk. Ms. Klobuchar. Ms. Klobuchar. Aye. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Kyle. Mr. Kyle. Aye. Ms. Landrew. Ms. Landrew. Aye. Mr. Lautenberg. Mr. Lautenberg. Aye. Mr. Leahy. Mr. Lee. Mr. Lee. Aye. Mr. Levin. Mr. Levin. Aye. Mr. Lieberman. Mr. Lieberman. Aye. Mr. Luger. Mr. Luger. Aye. Mr. Manchin. Mr. Manchin. Aye. Mr. McCain. Mr. McCain. Aye. Mrs. McCaskill. Mrs. McCaskill. Aye. Mr. McConnell. Mr. McConnell. Aye. Mr. Menendez. Mr. Merkley. Mr. Merkley. Aye. Ms. Mikulski. Ms. Mikulski. Aye. Mr. Moran. Mr. Moran. Aye. Ms. Murkowski. Ms. Murkowski. Aye. Mrs. Murray. Mrs. Murray. Aye. Mr. Nelson of Nebraska. Mr. Nelson of Nebraska. Aye. Mr. Nelson of Florida. Mr. Nelson of Florida. Aye. Mr. Paul. Mr. Paul. Aye. Mr. Portman. Mr. Portman. Aye. Mr. Pryor. Mr. Pryor. Aye. Mr. Reed of Rhode Island. Mr. Reed of Rhode Island. Aye. Mr. Reed of Nevada. Mr. Reed of Nevada. Aye. Mr. Risch. Mr. Risch. Aye. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts. Aye. Mr. Rockefeller. Mr. Rockefeller. Aye. Mr. Rubio. Mr. Rubio. Aye. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Sanders. Aye. Mr. Schumer. Mr. Schumer. Aye. Mr. Sessions. Mr. Sessions. Aye. Mrs. Shaheen. Mrs. Shaheen. Aye. Mr. Shelby. Ms. Snow. Ms. Snow. Aye. Ms. Stabenow. Ms. Stabenow. Aye. Mr. Tester. Mr. Tester. Aye. Mr. Thune. Mr. Thune. Aye. Mr. Toomey. Mr. Toomey. Aye. Mr. Udall of Colorado. Mr. Udall of Colorado. Aye. Mr. Udall of New Mexico. Mr. Udall of New Mexico. Aye. Mr. Vitter. Aye. Mr. Vitter. Aye. Mr. Warner. Mr. Warner. Aye. Mr. Webb. Mr. Webb. Aye. Mr. Whitehouse. Mr. Whitehouse. Aye. Mr. Wicker. Mr. Wicker. Aye. Mr. Wyden. Mr. Wyden. Aye. Mr. Blumenthal. Mr. Blumenthal. Aye. Mr. Hoven. Mr. Hoven. Aye.
Mr. Shelby. Mr. Shelby, aye. Mr. Leahy, Mr. Leahy, aye. Mr. Menendez, Mr. Menendez, aye. Mr. Harkin, Mr. Harkin, I. Any senators wishing to vote or to change their vote? Uh, the uh, vote is 97 to 0. The resolution is agreed to. Under the previous order, the preamble is agreed to and notions to reconsider are considered made and laid on the table. The Senate will proceed to a period of morning business with senators permitted to speak for up to 10 minutes each. Mr. President. Senator from Illinois. I suggest the absence of a quorum. Yes. Um, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
Madam President, I ask that the quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection. Madam President, uh, I rise today in support of the nomination of uh, John Jack McConnell to serve as a district court judge in the state of Rhode Island. Senate will come to order. Uh, we have heard and we will hear a number of very strong statements about this nomination. And I would argue very vociferously that uh, many assertions that have been made are inaccurate at best. And they're not shared by the legal and business community in Rhode Island. In fact, Jack McConnell is supported publicly and enthusiastically by the two former Republican Attorney Generals of Rhode Island, Arlene Violet and Jeff Pine. He is supported by the Greater Providence Chamber of Commerce, who knows him, works with him. And he is supported by our legal community, our business community. He has received the strong endorsement of our leading newspaper, the Providence Journal, which has a record of moderation, um, uh, indeed, if not uh, conservatism in terms of their judgments about judicial candidates and some issues, but certainly moderation. Now, later, Senator Whitehouse and I will respond specifically to the assertions and concerns, but I think it's time at this juncture to make a few brief points about where we are at this Senate. We are uh, at a point where we might be crossing a bridge in which we can't return. That unlike our previous history, district judges will be subject routinely to cloture motions because one faction or another decides, not on the merits, but procedurally, they should not go forward. Now, let me make a few points. Uh, Senator Whitehouse and I recommended Mr. McConnell to the President after publicly seeking applicants, talking to attorneys throughout our state, interviewing almost every single applicant, and we took this decision seriously as you would expect. And we know it's a reflection both upon ourselves and upon our state. And from this pool of applicants, we selected Mr. McConnell because we found him to be among the best attorneys in the state a pillar of our community, one of the most generous philanthropists in our state, and in most cases anonymously, and in many cases not simply writing a check, but standing in a soup line early in the morning handing out food to people who need it, without a claim, without fanfare. This is the character of an individual, and a character I think ultimately is a test of a judge. And he has a true desire to serve this country. Indeed. Mr. McConnell has practiced law for decades. He has never been subject to an ethics claim, a malpractice claim, a Rule 11 motion, and most importantly, he has never had a motion for sanctions filed against him concerning his conduct in any litigation he's been involved in. He has a spotless record. Moreover, we selected Mr. McConnell because we knew based on all of this, his personal background, his sworn testimony, that he will follow the precedents of the law and of the First Circuit Court of Appeals and the United States Supreme Court. This is not something we take lightly and it's not something that Mr. McConnell takes lightly. And we know and he knows that when you step upon the bench, you assume huge responsibilities. You have to not only appear to be impartial, you have to, in every word and deed, go the extra mile to demonstrate that impartiality, that you're not favoring anyone. And he is prepared to do that. In fact, I think that is part and parcel of this, the nature of this gentleman. Now, we have to stop here and, and ask ourselves collectively, do we want to go ahead and take this step of cloture for district court nominees? Do we really want to add another front in the battle of partisan political gutcha? Do they really want to cast aside, for example, the blue slip process, which allows senators from a home state, particularly with a district judge, to say yay or nay? It's a process that's been in this Senate, in the informal culture of this Senate, for years and years and years. Do they want to deny a nominee who's been reported out of committee on a bipartisan vote three times, not once, an up or down vote. 
I heard, and I've heard for years, particularly on President Bush, many people coming to this floor and declaiming everyone who's nominated and comes out of committee deserves an up or down vote, particularly the district court, especially the district court. So this is where we're, we're poised to reject all of that, to enter a new dimension of controversy and conflict in the Senate. We have a long history in the Senate of precedents and traditions when it comes to nominations, particularly district court nominations. And in my state, my predecessors, men like John Chafee and Claiborne Pell and Lincoln Chafee and John Pastore, clearly adhere to those standards. And we have a record, a strong record of judges in our state. And they've come from different backgrounds. They've come from the practice of corporate law. They've come from being a former federal attorney. They've come from being a significant and principal attorney for a major insurance company. They've come from a vast array of legal backgrounds and professions. One thing they've had in common, and which is shared by Jack McConnell, is integrity and commitment to the law. And that we insist upon. Now, we long recognize that these district judges serve a critical role and we all recognize too, I think, here as senators is that this is a special role of the home state senator. We understand that at the circuit level, when judges have to consider issues of constitutionality, where major policy issues could be resolved, in fact, finally resolved, at least for that circuit, we understand there there's another added dimension. But when district courts, we have traditionally recognized the judgment of not only the local senators, but the judgment of the local legal community. And once again here, both the legal community of Rhode Island, and I can't emphasize enough, two former Republican attorney generals that know him well, that have observed him closely, have come forward of their own volition and enthusiastically supported his candidacy. They know him as a lawyer. They know him as a man of integrity and honor and decency. Now, there are a number of my colleagues on the other side that recognize this, and they have been very forthright in making the point about the precipice that we are on and how that is not something, a precedent we want to establish. And I thank them for that. I thank them for the consideration. They have literally uh, adhered to consistently, not just in the past, but now, the notion that when a judge is given a qualified uh, approval by the ABA, when a nominee goes through the committee and comes to this floor at the district level, that's when a vote should take place. And how you vote on a final power passage, that is a function of many things. Your judicial philosophy versus their judicial philosophy. Your view of the judgment they have and the responsibility the district judge has. Now, we have, I think, again, been engaged in difficult debates. And they've been particularly difficult when it's come to the circuit court. And I do think we recognize collectively, because of the nature of the circuit court, rather, there is a difference. This is the, the gateway, and many times the cases never go beyond the circuit court. And constitutional law principles that apply to whole circuits are affirmed by these panels of judges. And there is a difference in it. But we've never really applied that standard to the district court. We've, resi we've relied, all of my colleagues have, on the ability of home state senators, together with their local lawyers, together with their local community, to make recommendations to serve on the district court. Let me point out how extraordinarily unusual the vote tomorrow will be. From our records, talking to the congressional research service and the Senate library. As far as we can consider, there have been only three cloture votes on Senate nominees for district court in the history of the Senate. Three times. Tomorrow will be the fourth. Oh, and by the way, all three of these individuals ultimately received confirmation. It appears from our reconstruction that they were caught up in a procedural discussion of who should go first. You know, this person shouldn't go first until others had been considered. 
All three were, were after the, the procedural votes on cloture, were confirmed. But it's quite clear that at least on the part of some, that this cloture vote tomorrow is designed to stop and end the confirmation of Mr. McConnell. That would be a first, as far as we know, in our reconstruction of the history of the Senate. So we are facing this question. The question of whether we want to establish this precedent, whether we want to disregard the record of this individual who is a man of integrity and honor, who is strongly supported by our local business community, who is strongly supported by Republican office holders as well as Democratic office holders, who has gained the trust and the respect of those who know him best, and who will serve with distinction and integrity on the District Court for the District of Rhode Island. That is the big issue we face tomorrow. Now, later I will, we will come down and we will respond to those issues, but I can rec of specific details. But I can recall uh, not too long ago when there was a group of Republicans and Democrats who came together and decided that these types of decisions should not be subject to procedural defeats, but they should be based on the merits. The Gang of 14's work on trying to pull together a consensus on judges. I know also both Senator Reid and Senator McConnell working with a, a group of people on a bipartisan understanding regarding executive nominations, not judicial nominations, but executive nominations. And these are very hopeful and positive signs. And I hope we could build on that progress and not tomorrow take a step which I think historically is atypical, unique, in fact a step I think in the very wrong direction. Now we will come back again and we will talk about the specifics of Mr. McConnell's nomination and these assertions, but all of these uh, allegations cast again not only a, a cloud upon Mr. McConnell, but on the ABA process, which looks very carefully at a, at a candidate in terms of their judicial skill, but also their character, their integrity, and their ability to serve. And the process here in the United States Senate through the committee process. So I would hope that uh, we can favorably consider, in fact, I would hope as typically we would move quickly to a, to a, a final passage vote, as we do with 99 out of a hundred district court nominees. But Madam President, this is a serious issue. I fear that we are on the precipice of taking a step that will come back repeatedly to haunt us and undercut a custom and a tradition and a sense of this Senate uh, which is necessary to maintain, not to abandon. And with that, Madam President, I would uh, Madam President. yield the floor. The Senator from Rhode Island. Madam President, I know I am in uh, Senator Landrieu's time, and I appreciate my friend's willingness to allow me just a moment to associate myself with the eloquent and thoughtful remarks of my senior senator and to urge all of my colleagues before we steer this body off the precipice that he referred to. Uh, to give his words their very careful and objective consideration. I thank the distinguished senator from Louisiana, and I yield the floor. Mr. President.